So I thought that was very interesting, that I landed in a place that talks about place, and I have a passion about place. And someone asked, what is, does topophilia mean? Uh, it got popularized uh, in the field of geography, but in essence it means love of place. And as you know, love has an irrational component. It just is, and sometimes it can be defined most specifically. And so that's how I uh, look at uh, the history of places. Um, the departure for this talk is grounded in historic photographs um, in several uh, local archives. Humboldt State University, of course, um, the Arcata Site Society for second, and uh, two particular uh, uh, four photographer uh, collections, the Schuster Collection, which are those wonderful uh, 1940s to 1950 aerial oblique uh, photographs, um, the early, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century photographs by Erickson, and then 20th century uh, photographs by our very own Peter Palmquist, uh, who was a uh, staff photographer at HSU for a very long time. And then um, my, my new favorite is a, the Hodgson Family Collection that's at the Arcata Science Society. And this is where we get to introduce um, awkward family photos as an historical uh, primary uh, uh, piece for collecting and piecing together the story, story of place. Uh, this particular talk is, uh, because I also am a journalist, by self-definition, uh, the, the perspectives of this particular talk are going to be similar to the perspectives of these Schuster photographs that you're going to see today. It's from up a bird's eye view. So we're going to have a panoramic view of the Creamery District, um, and we'll, we'll see uh, what it tells us. Um, what we're going to find uh, as we go through uh, the story of the Creamery District, um, three main themes. One, not only are we hyper-local, but we're very global. Uh, you'll see international and national reach through industry and commerce. Uh, we're going to look at the, the Creamery industry, the barrel factory industry, and, and touch, touchstone on the timber industry that we're well familiar uh, about. Um, and all of these industries are inter integral to our personal identity and our social identity. Third thing is we're going to see a lot of change. Some of the change is gradual, and some of the change is seismic, very quick. Um, we'll see also that what's happening uh, in Humboldt County, in uh, not just the Creamery District, but Humboldt County, is that we're not only the zeitgeist of the times, but also uh, we're reaching out and informing the world. So we're hyper-local and we're super-global all at the same time. So let's get started. Now we're going to see if my... Moving forward. Okay, setting the stage, the context. Um, on landscape architects, so I have to start with the landscape. Um, what we see is um, uh, our es Humboldt Bay est estuary uh, used to be in here, used to be 27,000 acres. Now it's 16. And I find it interesting that, uh, that the filling of the estuary was called reclaiming. Reclaiming, taking back, and making, the, the word itself made no sense. So, so it was really disturbing the ecology of the area, right? Um, then our, also what I'm talking about clearly is the settlement era, but let's acknowledge that this is part of the Wiat territory that goes up to as far north as the Mad River and as far south as the Eel. Um, I'm fascinated by the collage that you can see here. We have the built landscape, we have our agrarian landscape, and our, if you will, natural landscape. And I'll po propose that we actually have a fourth landscape where the true reclamation is happening, where we're bringing natural nature, 
in service to, in this case, uh, tertiary sewage treatment, but we're bringing back the idea of a working ecological system after we've uh, denigrated it ecologically uh, at the service of a timber industry. So let's see, continue on. Um, I jumped ahead here, but I made my points. Um, what's also interesting is the monumentality of the scale of all of our operations. Um, the landscape impact of changing the ecologies here uh, through the levees and creating an agrarian landscape. Uh, also, the monumentality of each of these industries were critical to the economic uh, viability of, of people who lived here. And it also expresses uh, we've had a consumptive um, uh, attitude towards landscape, whether we're consuming it by making agrarian, by processing uh, our timberlands, but it was our inalienable right uh, to do so. And I'm going to use the old fashioned way here. The construction of the Mad River Canal is one of these examples of how monumental um, and uh, the scale of what we did. And well, this is one of my favorite photos of the Arcata Bottom in that it shows the constellation of activities that were all happening at the same time in this one place. Um, we have our forest, and we have our, all these smokes, uh, our, our TP burners that ring the bottom. Here we see the, the mad river. We have our natural systems. We have our agrarian systems, um, an industrial scale of uh, harvesting and timber making. As we all know, uh, the, the Arcata Bottoms became our farming uh, hub, one of our farming hubs of the Humboldt Bay area. Um, and, and the idea about reclaiming, uh, I, I quote from uh, the Arcata Union, reclaiming our fine tillable land is a move in the right direction and one that will add much to the wealth of this end of the bay. So we moved, removed marshland and brush and spruce trees and, pan, and planted hay, oats, barley, peas, and potatoes. <coughs> and transportation made it possible. Uh, we all know about uh, the railroad that went out railroad line that went out one mile out into the Arcata Bay, um, but we also had ships that uh, helped move all the <laughs> timber um, and uh, reclaiming the lands. Um, another quote from our Arcata Union stated, uh, our functioning uh, ecosystem was described as a wasteland between Arcata and uh, Eureka. A railroad line um, finally came into play in 1875, and by 1914, uh, we had uh, the Northwest Pacific Railroad that linked Portland to San Francisco. Um, and this uh, railroad depot was in the Creamery District. Um, and it was next to the creamery building, and we'll have some aerial obliques that shows us the relationships with all that. Uh, I was struck by how this railroad depot was not only for the commerce of uh, the marriage of um, moving um, barrels and lumber, but also a place to gather and moving people to San Francisco and make a connection there. As we all know, Butter is big business in 
Arcata, uh, as well as uh, its, its formative place in, in Ferndale. Um, what's interesting is uh, the reverie of, the, uh, of our creamery uh, industry in, um, let me try another quote here, uh, the Arcata Creamery is finished. This is one of the first ones that was built in Arcata. Um, and it means inaugurating a new system in, far in the farming industry of the Arcata bottom. We believe indeed that a new era will dawn upon this productive portion of God's footstool. <laughs> the question has been thoroughly settled that dairying is the most profitable of all farming pursuits in Humboldt. So the potato made way to cows and clover. And then clover took over its own monoculture. And uh, our second uh, Arc Arcata Creamery was on Upper Bay Road and, quote, was the busiest place in 1893 uh, because between 21,000 22,000 pounds of milk were being handled daily. This is 1893. That's a lot of milk. Um, and so by then, a monoculture of clover uh, was outperforming um, potatoes, peas, and grains that were introduced in the bottom. And all of this foreshadowed um, our very own Creamery building and Creamery district in 1917. But I want to kind of back up a little bit before that one gets built. Here's a really fascinating photo before the Creamery district was built. Because what we have here in, uh, is the old uh, barrel factory. Um, so we had two main uh, industries in the Creamery District. Both were born in the early 20th century, and both closed together um, in years. They closed within two years of each other, um, 1956 and 58, um, the barrel factory and the Creamery. They employed hundreds of people. And both of these industries weathered the economic depression in two world wars. And our very own precious creamery building was built during World War I. So that says a lot about um, the industry and the motivation and the ability of the people that were living here at that time. Do you happen to know what street is that? Uh, this is 8th Street. 8th Street, okay. Right, and so what you see is a, uh, our unpaved gravel road with the wood plank sidewalks. Um, this is the tannery. Um, and what you start to see is right here is that train depot, a Victorian here that's still there. Um, farmhouse in the back is still there. But then the, um, what we have is the barrel factory. And our next, um, Seely Brothers photo is from the same angle, and we have the Korean rebuilding has been built. Um, everything's in full blown operation. You can see what it's doing to the air quality. I cannot imagine. I, I remember someone saying that during the t when the TP was were burning, you couldn't dry your clothes outside because you'd have to wash them again. Um, and what we'll learn uh, over the course of the talk is uh, Sound Lumber will also join uh, the Creamery District on uh, the west side of the um, barrel factory. And so speaking of barrel factory, uh, this is about uh, 30 acres, um, acre plant built in 1903. Uh, the firm was founded in uh, 1883 by a pioneer named John Coster. His son, Frederick, was president of the firm in 1905. So his son um, came up here to, to build this. So they built, uh, they, they built the plant to make the, the staves for assembly in San Francisco. So that's why the railroad would be terribly important. So they, they made them here. Uh, the refuse of what happened in the barrel factory got used for fuel to then um, be able to drive the, the milk in the drying tower here and that's um, and we have 
at this point the the cupola hasn't happened here, but here's our uh, a railroad station, creamery, and then uh, sound lum lumber will uh, come on board uh, pretty pretty quickly in the storyline. Um, the timber from uh, the, for the barrel factory uh, came from uh, the Redwood Creek and Klamath R River area. So even though it was hyper local in uh, the Creamery District, uh, the reach of the company itself to get the timber to do their their work was regional and impact and reach. Um, this was dangerous work, actually. Uh, uh, Performing it, um, but uh, the barrel factory employed about one um, over 1140 people, and by 1929 um, grew new markets to include veneer lath for uh, fruits and vegetables. So down south, where they were growing all the fruits and vegetables, well, where did all the, the boxes come from? Well, here we go. Um, and served most of the entire fruit and vegetable industry in, the, in uh, all of California. Um, and they built some all-bound boxes and crates uh, for vegetables, turkeys in the state of Utah, and then they built boxes for, for housewares like glass, stoves, refrigerators. Is that motors. mainly on the spruce or what, what do you know what kind of I don't know off the top of my head, but... Um, and some of the barrels were uh, made for, for sugar. And the Arcata Union said that more barrels than any other company west of the Mississippi were made here. So that, again, not only time and space, uh, weathering world wars, but again, this not just a regional reach, not just a, a local importance, but a, a national contribution. Um, and during the war, uh, World War II employed women and people of all ages, um, from teenagers to those uh, to be on retirement. So back to our epicenter of the Creamery District, Creamery Building, uh, built and uh, designed in uh, 1917 and designed by a local uh, architect, uh, Franklin Georgeson. Uh, he designed the St. Uh, Joseph Hospital, Meyer Theater, the Arca Arcata Post Office, and Eureka's uh, Women's Club. So he was very significant locally um, to make uh, our butter happen. Uh, you can't have a cream without cows, so we had to have our obligatory. Uh, photograph of our uh, furry friends. But uh, one of the things that uh, enabled this to happen was uh, uh, moving uh, several warehouses, one of which is the Sealy and Tilton Company building, which is now uh, on 10th Street and uh, is now home to the woodworkers uh, Joseph Amaral and Anthony Kahn. Uh, uh, City officials did move an Indian hostel. hostel. Uh, so the whole area was demolished uh, to create space for this brand new building that would punctuate um, California Central Creameries in um, the Creamery District. Mm -hmm. uh, the national and international reach of, of this particular uh, output was um, Let's see, they had in 1918, there was over a contract for 750,000 pounds of butter for the US Navy. Uh, a year later, they were producing 1,500 pounds of Golden Gate Swiss cheese, which sold in places as far as way as New York State. I would have thought they would have their own cheese, but. <laughs> Um, because of its long association with the Golden State trade name, um, California's Central Creameries uh, changed their name to the Golden State Milk Products Company. Uh, this tower over here on the left 
Um, that's where they dried the milk to create powdered milk. Uh, and most of the powdered milk was used for shipping overseas. Um, and they exported the butter fat and refined sugar to China and Japan. So again, uh, the, the monumentality of the operation, uh, not only supporting those that worked here, uh, but really uh, serving um, a national and international uh, community. And here's some of my favorite uh, series of photographs. If we go back to get ourselves oriented, here is the Arcata Plaza. Mm -hmm. and we go out 8th Street, and here is the Creamery Building, mm -hmm. and here is the Barrel Factory. And it's before sound lumber has uh, uh, settled in. Here again, you can start to, we've lost our cupola on uh, the creamery building. The barrel factory, it's 30 acres. Sound lumber starts to, to take shape. Uh, similar photograph um, from an information point of view, but just from a different perspective. Um, one of the things I like to see in the landscape is, uh, over time, what are the things that you can actually find on the ground um, from times past? So we have the creamery building and some of its ancillary buildings. Some of these, um, uh, some of these are, are still there. Um, Portuguese Hall is here. Um, this warehouse is still here. This line of worker housing is still here and will make a cameo appearance in uh, the conversation and the presentation of the sound number. And here, again, the railway. Well, railway that is critical for making all the industry happen here. Again, for orientation, here's the plaza, and we follow it back, and here's the creamy building, and here you can see the barrel factory is gone, and sound lumber starts to take over as a industry uh, of the Creamery District. Okay. Seven. Um, so Sound Lumber uh, comes to town in uh, the 40s and grows quite quickly. Um, this little uh, building is still uh, in the Creamery District and we'll find out soon what happens here. Um, one of those uh, teepees up, up close. And sound lumber in operation and as it expands. So the story of Sound Lumber is not just the prospect of creating product, but it also created a foundation for families to thrive. Um, um, and you can see how it built out the worker housing here. And this particular cherry tree is going to, you're going to see it over time. Um, what was helpful about this particular series of um, family photos, since we will see some um, awkward family photo uh, moments, it was the things in the background that started to t continue to inform the story. <coughs> so in uh, 1965, um, a fire broke out at Sound Lumber. And Peter Pump, as I heard from uh, someone who worked with Peter, said that uh, 
He saw the smoke, grabbed his camera, ran down the hill, and immediately started taking photographs. And because I too uh, like to say I'm a photographer, I got engrossed by this particular collection, um, Peter's um, uh, coll personal collection of photographs ended up at uh, Yale University. Mm -hmm. And uh, now's my time to have a shout out for all archivists and librarians that make it doing this kind of work possible. Uh, Edie Butler went to um, Yale University for a week to try and uh, make a subset of that collection that was specifically related to Humboldt County. And that's why this particular collection is called the Palm Quest Yale Collection, because it too is at Yale. Um, what fascinated me about uh, Peter's um, uh, documentary photographs is it tells several things at the same time. One, you cannot get away from the monumentality and scale and impact of what timber, timber, the timber uh, industry does. Uh, and the danger that's involved on a daily basis, not in just timbering the tree, making the lumber, processing it. And here you see community coming together to address a crisis. He does. I was thinking the same thing. Someone said he looks like James Dean. <laughs> James Dean look alike. It was. It took it all out. So we have our professional firefighters along with young kids, all hands on deck, addressing an emergency. And the, and where did all the water come from, for sure? And that was the end of Sound Lumber. The site became uh, a timber deck mm -hmm. after that. Do they know it started the fire? Uh, they might. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that can happen pretty quickly, too. Um, back to the Creamery District itself. Um, Closer to modern time, to get yourself oriented. Um, that could have been Merle Schuster himself, right? <laughs> Reincarnate. Uh, the Creamery building here, the barrel factory used to be here. This is where Tomas is. Greenway partners with the FedEx. Um, uh, Haleyashi here. So this is the, 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 zone, the zoned uh, creamery district area um, made possible through the advocacy of the people that are there and the businesses were there. Creamery yeah. district itself is a place uh, not just the buildings but the sites are uh, adaptive use and reuse. And what we'll find is uh, in the 50s, um, butter and milk made way to recreation and the arts. Um, uh, the Arcata Bowl, um, there was a bowling alley and a roller rink uh, sometime in there. And um, a Fred Vanny he was an army veteran from the Korean War, partnered with his brother Don and created um, a bowling alley in 1957 and by the 60s they added the pin room bar 
Um, by 1986, they, they sold it and it closed in 2001. But it was uh, a place where night shift mill workers and sailors from the, the lumber hauling ship loved to come there. So it was a place of community. Um, And by the 1970s, uh, the Finnegans um, uh, bought the building and it truly became a place of uh, performing and visual arts. Uh, we had a Pacific Arts Center in uh, 1977 was the Finnegans first uh, tenant. Uh, also in the 70s there was a Buddhist Zen Center. Um, and it, internal school, the Blue Dragon's Inn Temple, um, a, a good Buddhist retreat and training center um, that uh, came and went. Uh, by 1980, there was a, a dance center. Uh, and uh, by 2008, uh, Shoshana uh, comes on board. Um, in 2007, uh, Arcata Playhouse populates uh, the ground floor and today it's a place of performing visual arts uh, for local folks as well as uh, touring companies um, going from the San Francisco Bay Area up into Portland. Um, <clears throat> back to the Sound Lumber site, uh, the evolution uh, came into um, uh, so it's a, a, a logging deck um, for transport, and that is our. And then eventually. Um, Do you know if that was still by rail or uh, trucking? As far as this? Oh, if if we're talking about this uh, in the seventies, it would probably have 90s. to be nineties. Nineties, right here. Ninety. October nineties. Then October ninety, it would be trucks. Mm -hmm. We don't have trucks. any uh, yeah. trains. Um, and then we move on to the building of, building out of that area, and Marimba One building. Oh. And what I get, fa I'm fascinated in this, this cherry tree has grown up and changed over time, um, and everything around it. Yeah. Um, Haleashi uh, began in uh, the Creamery building and then uh, uh, built their own building um, and is one of the, the key attractions of the Creamery uh, district. Uh, Tomas has um, been there for a while, um, bought by the Good Collectives in 2016. We have this great photo that has um, the barrel factory from the roof, of, a view from the roof of the creamery building. And you can see the change mm -hmm. and see fragments of the barrel factory, mm -hmm. right? And these buildings there. Mm -hmm. The sound. Uh, Lumber site is now the site for Greenway. So part of the barrel factory tra gets transformed in into a place for the, the Yakima. Again, another homegrown hyper local business that uh, makes a home here and grows large and moves out. But what is helpful is understanding how um, the landscape consistency and change uh, happens over time. <clears throat> Our family photos of the uh, Cato train station. I heard rumors of being taken apart parts in someone's backwoods, but that, my friends, is rumor.
And here it is today. This is the location of where, because here's our railroad line, right? It's now a bike path. And then the railroad station would have been right here. And this is 9th Street, right? Okay. And the whole initiative within the Creamery District of bringing art to the center of uh, not just commerce, but everyday life, though the storage units there are what they are, but using them as a, a, a platform for bringing vibrancy into an industrial area. Uh, one of the initiatives of the Arcata Playhouse was to uh, commission local artists to install um, whimsical um, pieces. And so again, bringing art into uh, the public realm. Uh, I, I think this, this kind of sums up the, the, the quirky, uh, innovative um, ambitions of the Creamery District, um, Kinetic Lab. Uh, it's art, but constant motion. Um, this is one of the few buildings that are left from um, the barrel factory. It's in the center of um, the Creamery District. Here's one of the, yeah, we're like, yes, yes, it is the recycling center. And as we'll see, this is part of the creamery uh, complex, uh, still there. Portuguese hall, um, off to the edge of it. Um, here's the, the building that was moved from the creamery site. Um, it's now home to uh, carpenters. Um, this is along um, uh, K L F Street on the ed back edge of um, the Creamery District, and it's the art and the razor wire and the chain link fence and the perennials all in one place that kind of. Uh, says to me that um, with art and nature, we can pull it all together. And since uh, my first foray in pulling this together in 2014, a lot of change has even happened in the past four years. Um, this is a Haleashi site. They called it the Button Building, but now it's a little uh, cafe with their um, the best espresso in Humboldt County. <laughs> um, they uh, paved and improved the bike path that connects uh, downtown Arcata down to the marsh, 2016. Um, more new businesses. This is the recycling center. It's now a little shop. Um, Wrangletown Hard Cider and Yoga. Um, and even since last year, um, we have a brand new building coming in um, right on the edge of, uh, edge of town. What is that? It, well, how, housing. Spaces, housing? I, I believe so. Oh, God, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, <coughs> so for me, the, the story of the Creamery District is one of um, many layers. Um, and some of these layers get erased, and some of them still can be seen, and new things and new ideas and uh, new, new built uh, buildings happen. And I think, I think for me, the Creamery District is an example of how we can redefine the words reclamation and renewal, that they can be organic, that they can reintroduce um, natural ecology, that we can um, reclaim um, our identity 
in a way that can embrace um, a new horizon of the arts um, in a way that we did when we embraced the timber industry and the milk industry. Um, and by doing so, we're based in uh, authenticity. Um, it's ecological balance and it's a community equilibrium. And as I said before, I like the fragments of the past because it gives us a connection to those that came before us and it can give us um, inspiration on how to uh, really move forward in identifying how we tell um, our stories about ourselves, um, how we look and listen uh, to one another and our past. Um, I think uh, I'd like to thank again all the archivists and librarians, um, the repositories, and all the people that helped me navigate finding a home in Humboldt County and finding my own place in my community. So thank you all for coming. What happened to the very top of the creamery? The cupola? Yeah. Um, I'm a, I, I don't know the exact answer. I would just be uh, uh, making a guess. Um, but after uh, the creamery uh, industry started to go in decline, and uh, who knows from seismic situations. But that's an interesting question that going deeper and finding out the answer would be an embellishment to the story for sure. So the Sealy Tipo warehouse was moved from a, to where it is now, from somewhere else? Yes. It was um, where the Creamery building is. The whole area where the Creamery building is now is more than just, there's a series of buildings. Right. And so they cleared everything out, whether through demolition or by moving buildings. And that was one of the buildings. So it was where the Creamery is and it was moved north. Yeah. Correct. Do well, you know if it was? Um, um, did I finish your question? Oh, do you know what year that happened? Or I guess it'd be 1970. Yeah, it'd be 1916. Yeah. It was called the Creamery District because the Creamery Creamery sort of had this per se, and they wanted to expand if they wanted to. I don't know why all of those other things were incorporated in that thing called the Creamery District. The question is, why did they uh, call it the Creamery District? And I would say the Creamery District is a new term. Um, in nine, 2012, um, uh, Jackie Dandino of the Arcata Playhouse uh, wrote a, a grant to the NEA Our Town program and received $50,000 to start an initiative to create a district around the Creamery building. Okay. And so at that point, we started calling it the Creamery District because so much, just to acknowledge the history, that's yeah. the Creamery building, even though cream is not happening, sure. but it's an arts and commerce and creative culture. And the other people like Cal Barrel or whatever didn't have to pay a certain amount because uh, that was all later. <coughs> that was all like completely later. Okay, Correct. 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 Yes. So the district is in a, a register some, somehow, somewhere, natural recognition. Uh, the Creamery District has now um, been delineated by the city of Arcata. It's not designated an historic district at this time. Okay. The building is. The building is on the historic register? It's on um, the local register, yes. Local? Yeah. Is there, so there'd be a, a pretty seismic difference between the local and being on a national record? Yes, but if it qualifies at the local, 
you know, when you get into the world of eligibility, it doesn't have to be in the technical parts of preservation. Um, this may sound like an odd question, but I'm so curious about why, if you're going to make cream, you have an enormous tower with all these windows. Uh, is there a specific reason why it was built that way, or it was just the figment of the architect's imagination? I would say it's for two reasons. One, highly pragmatic, that they, they needed a uh, Heat rises, right? And so they needed to allow for heat to rise to keep the, the milk cool. Um, the concrete tower, that was a completely different thing for uh, the mechanics of drying the milk. Um, the ornamentation, that's all the architect. That's making an architectural statement for sure. The beauty of it, the cupola. A cupola on a creamery building. Well, that looks like it's supposed to be on, you know, I don't, I don't know, but yeah, that was an architectural expression. So he made it um, uh, useful. I think a, a, a water tank was in it or something like that. So he camouflaged something that was necessary within decoration. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.